I'm going to pour the next brew. Gentlemen? Yes. Speak. <laughs> Man, I get a couple of sips left of this All other right. one, but I think I have a new favorite. This is this was really this good, Mike. Really good. Is this still the show or is this? Uh, oh yeah, we're recording, man. <laughs> oh, all right. that was great. <laughs> yep. Mike, if you want to talk about what I'm pouring. Oh yeah, get my cheat sheet here. Uh, so one of the other uh, year-round standards, and uh, I know the group here kind of favors IPAs, so I had to to go there. <laughs> um, this is. Noble Beasts Evil Motives IPA, um, and this is an American IPA. It's seven percent ABV and has a sixty-five IBU. So this one might take your socks off a little. Noble Beast Evil Motives. You know we're evangelical. <laughs> <laughs> we're the only ones comfortable with this. Right. <laughs> Dave's like, I'm not coming back. Just <laughs> trying to think of like a phrasing you know we'll, we'll vanquish the noble <laughs> beat you know, like, you uh, go. <laughs> oh my gosh yeah the um i actually frequently you probably can't hear me over there i frequently favor ipas yeah i think it's a consensus amongst most of the group and even when i went to um the brewery and i asked hey you know what are some good ones we're doing a, a beer review on our podcast i was hoping he'd give us some free beer but he didn't um but uh, he said this is the, by far their most popular. Uh, Americans in general must really, really. I mean, IPAs are it, I suppose. Yeah. I do enjoy a good IPA, but I don't. That last one, that uh, alt beer was. V- very few graduate to the stout. It's like the. Right. It's like the Marines. <laughs> yeah, the few, the proud. Well put. No, I love IPAs. Now my wife is a big stout. Is she, she really? Loves stouts. Wow. What have, what have been some of the big hits so far on the show? Willoughby's Brewery. Uh, they have a, what is it, a chocolate stout? Oh, my Lord. No, it's a peanut, co- butter, peanut, peanut, butter, 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 cof- choc- peanut butter chocolate coffee. Oh, my gosh. That thing was amazing. Yeah, that's, oh, that's one of the favorites on the and show. And they had the, the yeah. raspberry. Right. And when you couple the two... You have a peanut butter and jelly. That's right. <laughs> Beer. All right. It sounds out there, out. but it's really good. As oh. Aaron passed these out, the whole room smells like hops right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, IPAs have definitely become one of my favorites. I love darks and IPAs. Oh, yeah, that is good. Oh, man, the nose on this thing is amazing. Ooh, nice. Okay, I'm in love. It's <laughs> good. That is fantastic because e- as most IPAs have that hard bite yeah um this one it has that a back bite you know so it's it doesn't hit you up front it, it has a nice like fruity overtone yeah you're it's right a, I it's can very, see why it's very citrusy popular. yeah but this is good this is dude really this good. is really good it, it hits you right in the side of your tongue yeah, yeah. It, it it's it's citrusy a little a little fruity but it's definitely got that ipa flavor you know what I'm going to say now? This would pair great with fish. Fish. Oh, I was going to go wings, but I always go wings. <laughs> <laughs> Gumby and I are definitely the fish guys. <laughs> no, man, this this would be good with it. Great. Two for two, Mike. Good picks. Yeah, I'm, I'm good, good job, job. Mike. I mean, good job. Yeah, yeah. IPAs aren't up there on my list, but this one's really this one, good. Yeah. Oh, man. You know, this is fantastic. For this show, um, is not none of both of these beers were not chilled to like I, I guess they set out a couple hours during the show and before the show so they're at like not a cold temperature but sort yeah. of a roomy temperature yeah, maybe 45 degree yeah and they it bodes well for the flavor I was just I gonna say yeah it's a good thinking temperature oh man <laughs> <It's great. laughs> it's good. but I don't know if it has something to do with the the creaminess but both beers or maybe maybe there's honey in their brew or something but something's real smooth about is both there honey of these. in this one. It doesn't I don't say honey. Um, it but doesn't. But no, you're right. Both of them have that are very smooth. Yeah. It 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 doesn't have that real strong bite as you say. Right. It, it goes down good. You 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 sense the hops in it because you you you, you get that taste. Yeah. Uh, but it does, as I say, it catches you on the side of your tongue. I think the uh, the, the fruitiness of that that hits that, and not a a sweet fruitiness but like a like a little citrusy yeah they say yeah. there's a 
with it's a West Coast style dry hopped IPA brewed to be a drinkable or uh, brewed to be drinkable with big additions of Citra and Simcoe hops introduced with experimental hopping techniques. So, hmm. Hmm. what if they involve rabbits? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I like that was quick. <laughs> They'll yeah. Pop, pop, pop and long. Yeah. This is it's it's. I I, I might have a new favorite. <laughs> Mike, said, I think I, you found a new place for us all. Yeah, it's really good. I I was uh, enjoying um, one of uh, Great Lakes ones earlier. It was I, IPA. Uh, it's one of their session brews, the new one for the summer. I don't remember the name of it right now, but it was it has more of that IPA you know bite on it. You know, so whereas some people are not going to like that. My wife didn't like it. I enjoyed it. Um, but this, I could see her enjoying this one because it has that nice fruity overtone. You know? Yeah, for sure. Not sweet, but that nice, it's a nice overtone. Yeah. I think I'd, I'd want this with a fish or if I'm going to eat somewhere. The first beer, I would stock at home. Okay. Yeah, that was really good. That's a lot. I agree. Yeah. I agree. The first one I think might be number top three beer on my list moving forward. Yeah. Oh, there you go. And this this one's probably my favorite IPA. I think yeah. Fat Tire makes a really good one that I like a lot. Okay. But as far as local brewery, I, I don't know if Fat Tire is local, but um, yeah, this one's really good for IPA. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm enjoying it. No, like, I don't think Fat Tire oh, is, but they do have great beer. Yeah. We'll have to do one session where we just bring in our favorite beer. Have you guys oh, done good idea. Fat Heads yet? Oh, yeah. Yes, oh, we, we did yeah. have Fat Heads. Oh, yeah. We have some good IPAs. Yes, we did. Yeah. We did Fat Heads. <laughs> but yeah, we did the... We could always... They have so much. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think we just keep that making it around. a whole season. Mm-hmm. We actually probably should create a spreadsheet so as we buy, we, we consult the spreadsheet to make sure we don't double up. That's a good idea. That's and we could idea. score. Like, might have to go back and drink some more again. <laughs> but uh, we could kind of put our notes in there. Well, and, and every it's all brewery. all for the cause. All for the cause. <laughs> yeah. And every brewery has several different, you know, brands and often seasonals. Yeah. So, I mean, I mean, we're never going to run out. You're right. And I think we should open up to the listeners, too. Like, if you have any suggestions on what you want to hear out of our beer review or even our discussions, you know, chime in. Yep. Definitely. Yeah. And how can they do that, Aaron? Well, well, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> they can hit us up on Twitter, uh, Instagram, Facebook, Google+, or Tumblr. So we're, we're pretty on pretty much on, every, on everything right now. Pieballoverbrews.com. Yeah. That's right. And I guess that would really only apply to on those in the greater Cleveland area. Um, maybe some things that cross over They want to mail something. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, like Kentucky Bourbon, you know, before they – became popular here it was so hard to get yeah it was um but now happy to say it's here here <laughs> but the last episode i believe tasting oh yeah we reviewed one that was shipping their beer across the country in a, a customized way i don't remember what right. was the name of that oh movie? yeah it was granite cool. city granite city oh, okay yeah, so they had this patented method of shipping the beer so it's is brewed so it tastes the same and Cleveland as it does in wherever it's shipped to. So and that that one's interesting because in their idea they start it inside of their their brewery their HQ, and they export it out to each one of the locations and they they complete the full brewing process on site. So technically every single one of those is local. Now they had the most amazing growler. Uh, if oh I yeah, remember. right. <laughs> this thing was incredible, Dave. Th- uh, you didn't see it, did you, Steve? Mm-hmm. Oh I my gosh. I I have them. You'll see them. It's like a highly pressurized growler, Bluetooth compatible. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> it's, not, it's not really. <laughs> Definitely not Bluetooth compatible. But yeah, but the, top, the top was pretty sick. Yeah. yeah. It was incredible. Hey, hey, That's hey, cool. Hey, Steve, if you go to our Instagram page, you can see it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not an Instagram person. Oh, you will be. <laughs> Everybody's doing it, Steve. Yeah, I know. No peer pressure. <laughs> I'm not doing it. Don't Steve, worry. I'm not an Instagram person either. So. But actually, we <laughs> use it with our business, so I, I can't. My wife's more the Instagram person than I am. Oh, okay. What, and what's your business, Steve? Our business is ImagesInBloom.com. We have our own e-commerce site. Shameless plug. 
<laughs> I use the shaving soap, not frequently enough, but it is very good, and, and it's a good gift too. I, um, I want to get it for my brother this year. It's, it's kind of like the throwback, you know. You, you buy these things at Walmart, these shavers, but then you you go to Steve and he gives you the shaving brush and and uh, good, oh, wow. good soap, and it's just kind of cool to work up a lather. Kind of think back to, I feel like John Wayne sometimes doing it. So, are you using the straight edge? I want a, do you sell straight edges yet? You got any good straight actually, edges, Steve? Actually, uh, Mike, what happens with those is uh, I'm actually going to York, Pennsylvania. There's a guy there who uh, I run into. He restores them, but they wholesale at $110. Right. But they are so cool. I mean, these are like the old, the the the. I mean, really precious. I mean, these things look. They are like. Top notch. Yeah, most of them are handmade when you get into that, and it's an art form. I've seen some stuff, you know, it's, I want to buy it because I saw how they're made, and they are, you know, a lot yeah. of cares put into them, and it's, it's just kind of cool. Yeah, he, I he, saw, he, he I saw them in practice him. on uh, Sweeney Todd. <laughs> yeah. So I will be running into him in probably about three weeks. Steve, you and your wife are master tradesmen <laughs> and women. Tradesmen, but. I'm sitting next to Steve, and he does smell really good. So, <laughs> I, that's what I did take a shower this morning. So, <laughs> I like his energy soap. <laughs> yeah, there you go. All right. So, going into Second Temple, Zerubbabel's Temple. Best name ever in the Bible. Right. Sure. I am shocked I pronounced that right. Is that so. his first or last name? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <It's both. laughs> One of those. Uh, the temple built to replace Solomon's temple, which stood from around 950 B.C. until the Babylonians destroyed it in 587. The second temple was built under the leadership of Zerubbabel, an exile who returned from Babylon to Jerusalem sometime between 539 and 521 B.C. Zerubbabel, whose name means seed slash descendant of Babylon, first appears in Ezra 2.2 as an exile who returned to Jerusalem after the Babylonian exile. Pardon me. In Ezra 3 6, he is identified as the son of Shetil, who takes a pivotal role in rebuilding the temple that the Babylonians had destroyed in 587. Zerubbabel may be identified with. Sh- I'm going to skewer this. Sheshabazar, right? <laughs> the prince of Judah, <laughs> mentioned in Ezra 1 8, since both are described as governor of Judah. And he are credited with laying the foundation of the temple. So this is the architect of the, or, or at least the director of the second temple. I mean, there may have been an architect involved who just didn't get credit, but <laughs> he's the guy who he's the guy who made it happen. <laughs> could could have been the finance. No, he no, was no, the not. project manager. There you go. There you go. Mm, the builder. Well put. Yeah. <laughs> so. Um, it says that it refers to Zerubbabel as a governor, a leader of a group of returning exiles, and speaks of God's restoring him as his signet ring. That, predict, that prediction indicates a reversal of a Jeremiah 2.2.2.4, which declared that God would tear his signet ring, King Jehoiakim, from the divine finger and give him and his kingdom to Babylon. A guy seems to have understood Zerubbabel as a descendant of David through whom the Davidic dynasty would be restored. Uh, the prophet Zechariah speaks of Zerubbabel restoring the temple in Zechariah 4.9. Zechariah 6.11, which speaks of a future leader of Jerusalem, may have originally referred to Zerubbabel along with Joshua, but eventually the name Zerubbabel was dropped out. The biblical text provides no information about Zerubbabel's fate. He may have been removed by the Persians, or he may have died in Judah. It also is possible that he returned to Babylon after completing his work on the temple. Unless his wife didn't like it. So we don't know. Nope. <laughs> so, once again, he is the project manager, as you said. <laughs> so, and the second temple did well. Um, I have a slide in here on all the dimensions, but we're not going to go over that. It's boring. <laughs> Um, the second temple stood for a very long time, you know, all the way through the second temple era, hence second temple era. (laughs) Um, and that's where we get a lot of our cool writings from, right? So, um, that's where you get, uh, 
well, supposedly, that's where you get, like, you know, the Book of Enoch. That's where you get the Maccabean uh, books. That's where you get uh, uh, Jubilees. Um, the Second Temple period was a great time of uh, all these texts that were written out. Wow. I didn't. I just imagined the Book of Enoch would predate Babylon, Babylonian times. Well, in legend, it does. So, and, and we will have an Enoch episode. But according to legend, um, the Book of Enoch was actually on the ark with Noah. So, now, historically, scholars do believe that it was compiled during the Second Temple period. Mm. We don't know. But they do believe that it was compiled during the Second Temple period. Mm. Um, and, of course, as, as we've illustrated, much of your... New Testament theology is pulled directly out of uh, the Book of Enoch. It's yeah. fascinating because without that, a lot of your New Testament theology goes away. And again, Christ did reference it at least eight times. Yeah, Dave, what mm. what is the kind of Catholic position with with books like the Book of Enoch, or is it something that um, I mean, is it legitimate? Is it something you? What what is your position with <laughs> Enoch from the from an evangelical's position? Yeah, uh, it doesn't exist. Yeah, it's it's if it's not in never happened. <laughs> yeah, it's heresy. <laughs> well, but again, so is the book of Let, let me say this, <laughs> and and hopefully no like bishops are listening to this or anything like yeah. that. There are I know. What they, I think they call it the deuterocanonical books. Yep, correct. Yeah. That There's don't, four, 14 of them, right? Do, yeah, that are in the Catholic canon. Yeah. You, maybe you guys can help me. Is Enoch one of those? No. In the, uh, <laughs> no. Okay. No. The, only, the, only, the only churches that include Enoch in its canon would be uh, the Ethiopian Orthodox, uh, Beta Israel, and the Erethritria. Those are the three that include it in their canon. Um, now, mind you, those are also, also among the oldest churches, too. Well, I mean, technically, Beta Israel is Jewish, but, um, you know, uh, Ethiopia is one of the very oldest right. churches in the world, or uh, countries in the world. In fact, uh, Ethiopia historically can be linked to an older country, in as far as Christianity goes, than even Armenia. Ar- Armenia claims that, they're, that they are the oldest Christian country but they don't have the archaeology to back it up. <laughs> Ethiopia does. So, and they do include it in their canon. So. And they also drink beer. They do. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the only thing I know about them, so i got to throw it out. <laughs> you know, whenever I read those, you know, and there, there are some non-canonical gospels out there too, you know, and I would say this would probably be, be my approach with Enoch. If there's things in it of value, you know, mm-hmm. and that... that resonate with you know then i think there's there's so certainly value in things outside of our canon but it's it's so not you're personally open to it yeah i okay. i I've, i'm not real familiar with it though okay okay yeah cool i mean that's uh, the book of enoch is actually the origin of where you get the idea of the lake of fire hmm. um it's it refers to the saints and uh, the eternal life that they will have um, there's a lot of New Testament theology that is not in the Old Testament and resonates directly from the book of Enoch and, like, no other source. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. So it's fascinating. It's uh, pretty controversial because it gets into sort of uh, the reason of the flood and things like that, yeah. doesn't it? I mean, I haven't read it. It's on my list. <laughs> I don't know if Oprah condones it or not. <laughs> what well, is a bestseller on the New York Times? So. Okay, there it is. There well, you go. Yeah. I learned something. I've learned a lot, actually. So <laughs> awesome. Enjoying that. Yeah, it's a great book. It really I is. I have read it. Yeah. 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 What did you think? I, I, I understand why it's not in, the, as you say, the canon. <laughs> and, the, and, and it's okay, yeah. mm-hmm. but it is great for a reference. What about impacting your faith in any way? I think it increases it. Oh, mine too. Okay. It drastically. Yeah. It, 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 I've said this for many years since first reading it. Without the book of Enoch, 
a lot of the Bible is hard to understand. Once you read the book of Enoch, the Bible is so much easier to understand. It puts because it in it, context. It really does. Wow. It, it's, it's like that little key. It's like that little missing piece of the puzzle where you're like, ah, is that a tiger? Is it a kitten? <laughs> I'm not quite sure. You put that little piece in the puzzle, and the whole thing suddenly makes sense. Wow. But why wouldn't they give us the key <laughs> to the Bible? Believe it or not, okay, so I'm, I'm, this, we're going to rabbit trail on this one for a second. Yeah, we are. So, I know, it's okay. We can, <laughs> it's hoppy beer anyways. Right? <laughs> yeah. Ooh, well played. Well played. <laughs> Good fun. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, believe it or not, it was a Catholic source where I found my answer. Um, I dug around for a great while to find out why it was not in the canon, because most of what I heard was hearsay. It's like, well, it wasn't included because of this, or that, or this. And many of the early church fathers, including big ones like Tertullian, uh, many of the early church fathers advocated it for it being in the Bible. Um, but here's where I found out was the turning point. They could not find a copy that predated the birth and death of Christ. Okay. And so there, uh, Jesus Christ is called Son of Man in the Old Testament in reference only twice. Specifically once in prediction, but twice there's reference. Inside the book of Enoch, 16 times he's referred to as the Son of Man. And so because of that, they wanted to make sure they had a copy that predated the birth and death of Christ, and they could not find one. And so it was not included in the canon. Well, since the Dead Sea Scrolls and everything else, we now know that it did exist before Christ, but at that time they didn't have any copies that did. So really it could go back because in... in so we're just waiting for another council? <laughs> <laughs> well, in ancient church tradition, the Old Testament was never closed. So okay. technically, they could include in the canon later. Yeah, I was going to say, because a lot of the mm -hmm. councils, they still meet, actually. There's a council that still meets, right? There was one, was it, I think it was last year. It was last year. And then uh, I know they're, they're playing uh, another one in the near future. But yeah. So, so it could it's happen. Crazy. So we could just get like a letter in our mail and say, hey, by the way, Enoch is now included. <laughs> <laughs> oh, here, Nelson. Well, I didn't think all the Bibles that would be so. <laughs> oh, by the oh. way, Nelson Publishing, Ooh. you've uh, got to re re rewrite all your Bibles. Yeah. I, I'm not going to hold my breath. But then again, hey, yeah. Protestants yeah. decided to go ahead and drop a whole bunch of, of books out of oh, the Bible. So, you know. Shot. Ding, ding. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Ooh. how hoppy is this beer, Mike? <laughs> Ow. <laughs> you know, though, on the beer note, like this. It sits really well. Like, if you don't take a sip for five minutes, it's not like yeah. it keeps that bitter aftertaste. It's I really, really both of these beers. Right? Yeah. <laughs> High quality. No doubt. Somebody actually cared. And, and I know this would offend uh, Aaron, though, but it would be really nice with a good steak on a grill. Ah, I can't. I know. <laughs> Sear salmon, you know, or tuna would be good, too. I could oh, I do that. Yes. I could do that. My pescatarian yeah. self. Well, Aaron, you're not the only pes pescatarian five-finger wearer in this group. Oh, great. Awesome. Yeah. Oh, cheers. 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 Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm moving in that direction. For those who Aaron, don't know, I don't eat red meat or poultry. I am a pescatarian. I occasionally eat fish. That's it as far as meat goes. Can you still be American and do that? <laughs> <laughs> but it's not an ethical they, decision. They, they, ha they haven't kicked me out yet. What does Enoch so. say about that? <laughs> <laughs> well, in reality, though, I mean, truthfully, though, red meat is not good for you. It really is not. And poultry is not that great either. I hear it's horrible for your prostate. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> and, and, and if you want to eat healthier, though, you, we, we definitely, because uh, this is things that I really wrestle with in, in healthy eating. And... Uh, the healthier I eat, the better I feel. I lose weight. My diabetes gets in nice and balanced. And and but for some reason, this other stuff's like uh, like an addiction to heroin, you know. So <laughs> <laughs> that's all the steroids in the meat. <laughs> Probably is. That's my dig at red meat. <laughs> all right. So I'm going to segue back. Um, I'm going to read this off. This is a, like a brief history. All right, so Zerubbabel's uh, temple 
function until the rule of the solicit Antiochus the fourth is fourth, right? Once again, I'm horrible with Roman stuff. Why we're here? <laughs> Aren't you He's... learning Greek though? Greek is not Roman. It's not. <laughs> I'm not learning Greek, so I can say that. He's got to take a course in Latin now. <laughs> it's all right. Greek to you. Right? <laughs> <laughs> oh. Touche. <laughs> in 169 BC, according to one Maccabees, one of those books they dropped out of the Protestant Bible. It's in the Catholic Bible. <laughs> 120 through 28. <laughs> And Tychus IV entered the temple and removed the vessels used in the sanctuary. Daniel 9.27 speaks of Antiochus' desecration of the temple as the abomination that makes desolation. According to Jerome, Antiochus set up an image of Jupiter Olympus on the temple grounds. Josephus recorded that Antiochus built a pagan altar on the original altar and sacrificed a pig on it. The Maccabean Revolt freed Jerusalem from foreign control and led to local leadership by the Hasmoneans. In 63 BC, the Roman general Pompey attacked Jerusalem and entered the temple, simultaneously desecrating it and claiming Roman authority over it. Herod the Great renovated the temple, beginning in the 18th year of his reign around 20 BC. It was destroyed by the Romans in AD 70. Hmm. Now... Ready? Ten points for anybody who can tell me out of the Maccabean books where it describes the rededication of the temple, what holiday came out of that? Hanukkah. Good job. <laughs> it was Hanukkah. So Very nice. <laughs> very good. Um, yeah, so when the Maccabeans overtook and retook the temple... They had a dedication ceremony, which was the Festival of Lights, right? Because of the uh, oil burning. It was only one day worth of oil, in the boil, and it went on for eight days straight. And that ended up being the celebration of Hanukkah in honor of that. Like so you get the prize? Yes. Ten points. Yeah, it'll be in I the already middle. got the prize. <laughs> Ding. When I read that, when you read it and I listened, it's prophecy fulfilled. I where do dispensationalists get off thinking that this is a future event? Well, I, I think you have to be a dispensationalist to actually, you know, answer that question because the, you need a, a slightly cluttered mind. <coughs> yeah. I, it, it, <laughs> you described it, it happened, and there it is. Right? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it's just the, the hoppy beer. It's speaking. <laughs> so according to Britannica... Jewish rebellion against Roman rule in Judea. The first Jewish revolt was the result of a long series of clashes in which small groups of Jews offered sporadic resistance to the Romans, who in turn responded with severe countermeasures. In the fall of 66, the Jews combined revolt, expelled the Romans from Jerusalem, and overwhelmed in the pass of Beth Haran, a Roman punitive force under Gallus, the imperial legate in Syria. A revolutionary government was then set up and extended its influence throughout the whole country. Vespasian, who's been talked about quite a bit tonight, was dispatched by the Roman emperor Nero to crush the rebellion. He was joined by Titus, remember that name, and together the Roman armies entered Galilee, where the historian Josephus, who we also talked about tonight, headed the Jewish forces. Josephus' army was confronted by that, by that of Vespasian and fled. After the fall of the fortress of Jadapada, cannot believe I pronounced that right, Josephus gave himself up and the Roman forces swept the country. On the ninth of the month of Av, in AD 70, Jerusalem fell. The temple was burned and the Jewish state collapsed. Although the fortress of Masada was not conquered, conquered by the Roman general Flavius Silva until April 73. Now, this is not the Titus that wrote the book in the New Testament. No, 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 no. But Titus is a very important person inside that history. Titus was the one who was directly responsible for tearing down the Jewish temple. The second time. <laughs> not the first one. So um, he was the one who was directly responsible for that. So whenever you hear about the prophecies by Jesus, and he speaks about there will not be one stone turned upon another. He ignited the flames so hot inside the temple, it actually melted all the gold and metals that were still inside the temple afterwards, 
And on top of that, the they literally did pull every single stone down, and there was not one left one on another. And that was Titus. He's the one that did it. That's why that name right there should resonate with you. Um, and Josephus, the historian, as you could see, was much more intimately involved. Than <laughs> oh, yeah. But it's prophesied by Jesus, who reestablished the temple and his people. Yeah. No need for a physical temple. Well, we'll talk about that in a second. <laughs> I know we're getting there. Very controversial. <laughs> Currently, most people believe that the temple, I'm not reading, I'm just talking. Uh, most people believe currently that where the Dome of the Rock is, you know, that, that huge monument to, to Islam, most people believe that that is where the temple once stood. And so that's where a lot of your evangelicals will say that, you know, this is the reason why there could be a world war coming up and uh, there's so much combative, you know, effort back and forth between them is because everybody wants this little tiny plot of land um, is because of where the Dome of the Rock sits. And that that right there, I'm, I'm, no, I know Gumby's just itching to say something right now. <laughs> um, that right there is quite controversial because... It was ooh. destroyed. <laughs> it, Not one rock stood. Well, it, it's more than that. It's more than that. So where the Dome of the Rock sits is not necessarily where the temple stood. A lot of people believe that. And every single Jew that goes to the Wailing Wall believes that is the Wailing Wall. But historically, a lot of figures disagree, including big ones like Josephus, um, among many others. I mean, there was, there was a, a series of names. I, for some reason, I dip on this list here. Um, there was a series of names of historical figures, even Roman generals, who all listed where the fortress was. Um, oh, let me think, what was it called? What was it called? Uh, Fort Antone, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that's where the Roman armies gathered. There was 6,000-plus soldiers in there, and that's not including their servants and everything else and people who actually helped make it run. Um, probably 10,000 people once you include all the help. That's actually where the Dome of the Rock set is out on the, outs on the outskirts of that fortress. The temple itself was more than likely to the south of where you see the city of David. And that is according to many historical accounts and eyewitness accounts. So it more than likely did not sit where the Dome of the Rock is. I'm going to read off right here real quick. In New Testament uh, times, the Haram Esh Sharif was the site of a Roman fort and a military camp called Fort oh, I'm sorry, Antonia. Ancient witnesses reveal that the Haram was indeed the Roman fort and it was, large, uh, was a large enclosed military camp, some 36 acres in area, which, as you know, if you've ever seen the Dome of the Rock, that's not 36 acres, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, it was a miniature Roman city with its own administration, living quarters, and temple structure to accommodate some 6,000 thousand soldiers of the 10th legion. The, du the Jewish temple itself was built above the Gihon Spring in the city of David so that the water could be drawn up for purification purposes. The temple was to the north of David's city on a mound called Ophel. David's city itself was called the Citadel, a mound to the south also called Mount Zion. Sorry, I'm sorry, reverse those two. <laughs> now, those two sit I want to say parallel to where the Dome of the Rock is, not over top of it. So if you actually look at the geography of that, they're looking at the wrong area. And the Gihon Spring is one of those that is very telling because they had to use it for purification purposes. The priest had to bathe. Uh, they had to wash utensils. They had to keep things uh, ceremonially clean. So if you actually look at that, the Gihon Spring sits over there on the north side, not over where the Dome of the Rock is. So it wouldn't make sense for it to be there. So, so I, well, my, I guess my question is then, in, in regards to rabbinic Judaism and Orthodox uh, Jews, 
who were they praying to when they prayed at the wall? Well, I mean, they're, they're still praying to Yahweh. Um, the trouble is, is that when they're on the Wailing Wall, what they're actually looking at and praying at would be the retaining wall of what the Roman fortress was. Right. No, I yeah, definitely agree with that. I, I would think that it wouldn't be that hard for them to figure that out. <laughs> well, it's... I should have wrote this down. There... So it goes back to 1866. There was, I it escapes me, there's a historian mm-hmm. who went over to Israel, and he's the one responsible for claiming that that was part of the temple. Yeah, yeah. So it, I've also it, heard Brother Nathaniel uh, echo great source. that. Yeah. Was he an <laughs> evangelical? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, he was just a, a mistaken historian. Oh, oh, sorry, guys. <laughs> He was just a, just a mistaken historian, and I, I don't remember his name. I should have wrote it down for today. Um, but it doesn't go back to ancient times. It, it just goes back to 1866, and he's the one that mispronounced the location. Yeah. So it's fairly fascinating. Well, Nathaniel's view, he, he, was a, he grew up Orthodox uh, Jew, converted to uh, Orthodox Christianity. Mm-hmm. But his view of what they pray to is not Yahweh. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's as I'm just reflecting on this this whole presentation. It's destruction. It's forts. It's you know. I mean, it's just this tragic story, really, of of us, right? You know, and I'm reminded of. A scholar, he's not Catholic, Walter Wink. Um, I'm not sure what denomination he was, but he says the weaponless victory of the Roman Empire over Christianity was accompanied by the weaponless, I'm sorry, the weaponless victory of Christianity over the Roman Empire was accompanied by the weaponless victory of the Roman Empire over Christianity. And, and, you know, this is what I, you know, for me, I think in big picture, you know, might we think the gospel is pointing us in a different direction <laughs> of, you know, victories and, you know, war and destruction and, yeah, and yeah. you know, I mean, I think sometimes, you know, to what extent do we interpret Christianity through an empire lens? Sure. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. A different kind of kingdom. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's even been war generals that were known for not having wars and overtaking whole cities and countries. Uh, Cyrus. Cyrus, uh, that harkens back to uh, Daniel, the book of Daniel. He was known as the war general that would t- overtake cities with no effort. He would just strategically plan the right time, and he would walk in with his generals during feasts and everything else, make sure they were all staged in the right areas. They would all stand up and say, okay, we're, we've taken over. And that was it. I mean, yeah. that, it, it was, it's brilliant. Yeah. You know? And it's, uh, in, his, in his subtleties, he was able to win these places over without, without wars. That's brilliant. Wouldn't it be hard <laughs> here in America just cut off our internet and... <laughs> <laughs> riot, riot, riot. We wouldn't know what to do. Oh, my God, I don't have Google. <laughs> I don't know. I think you take that. That's one thing that will bring us all together. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, you might be right. <laughs> but so. it's true. To your point, Dave, I mean, man, how many times, uh, for me, I keep saying, man, it destroyed. Destroyed. Yeah. Destroyed. Yeah. And, and it yet, doesn't stop after the Roman Empire becomes Christian. No. And, you know, it doesn't stop no. even it, into our own time. There is a concerted effort today to still rebuild um, what was destroyed. Oh, yeah. What is considered yeah. I mean, by many is divine judgment. Right. I mean, I'm pretty sure that's the next slide, too. <laughs> <laughs> ah, that leads up to really no, interesting things. No, it's, it's true. It's true. It's um, for some reason... Let's 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 finish the, dis- the 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 this uh this quote right here. Tacitus, the Roman historian 400 years after Aristius, 
and recorded that the temple at Jerusalem had a, had a natural spring of water that welled from its interior. Again, these references could only be describing the Gihon Spring. It is located close to what is referred to as the Ophel, which is a bulge of the earth abutting the city of David. Laying just to the south and roughly about 1,000 feet from the Temple Mount, there is no other such spring anywhere else in Jerusalem. However, there is a place called the en which is situated above third of a mile southeast of the city of David, but this is not a spring at all, rather a well. The spring connection, especially a robusting gushing spring, seems to be like a laser pointer aimed at the city of David and not at the Temple Mount as a temple site. Now, we can talk about Third Temple. <laughs> but um, no, you are right. There is, for some reason, there is this giant push. Now, now on, on the Jewish side, I understand it. On the Jewish side, I understand it because... They don't have the hope of their yeah, yeah. Um, of their savior, right? Yeah, they're still awaiting their Messiah. Right. So on the Jewish side, I totally understand it. They're they're trying to create something to bring their Messiah to them. Right. Right. So I get it on the Jewish side. I don't get it on the evangelical side. The Christian Zionist side. Yeah. <laughs> Koofy. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. So yeah, on on that side, I just don't get it. Um, if we are supposed to be the temple, you know, the body of Christ, I don't understand what the push is, you know. Except, I mean, there is the misreading of of Revelation, which we are going to do a whole episode on that because I'm loving it. So <laughs> we're going to do that a whole back episode to our, on Revelation. Our dispensational theology, right? Um, it, it's misreading of Scripture that really harkens back to it. Because if you look at it, Jesus in Matthew 24, 1 through 25, 46, in Mark 13, 1 through 37, and in Luke 21, 5 through 36, talks about this. And it, it says, that, I mean, right here, the signs of Matthew 24 prophecies, the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, not the second coming, and certainly not some rapture theology that was invented in 1830 AD by John Darby. When Christians saw the signs, they fled the city and were saved. Literally. You got to laugh at it, Dave. I'm kind of interested to hear, you, <laughs> to hear your thought on that. I it, mean, is that something... I didn't... I. I didn't know that that exact information, but yeah, your nay. <laughs> you know, the I, I do tend to think a lot of that theology comes from not understanding some of that story as you know the context it was written in. You know, and and so yeah, yeah. Good. But that's interesting. It, it, it filled in some info for me. I, I thought that's an interesting point. I mean, let's let's think about it. Yeah. Jesus Christ said, this generation shall not pass away before the, right? The, okay. And he also references the events that are directly happening 40 years later within that generation. So 70 AD really is that pinnacle touching point on all of those quote-unquote future prophecies so it's amazing when you link them all together and read them together, and then you look at 70 A.D. It's right there. I mean, it's 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 historically backed. It's textually backed. It's it's amazing. Yeah. And there's a lot more touching points inside the Book of Revelation. We're, we'll do a whole episode on that because I found a whole bunch more information. Just, just one just, for Revelation. It's just fascinating. It, it it could parlay into a two-parter. We'll see. We'll see. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean. Y- you can't really have the discussion without really saying our first Christians, our first conversions were Jewish. They accepted Christ, and it worked. As Messiah. Right? Paul, it worked. Yeah. He accepted Christ. So for those who won't accept that, I believe that's where the push comes from still wanting to have a temple, because if they're anticipating their Messiah, he's going to rule from the temple. For yeah. what? Because Christ's kingdom is something, uh, it's way different than what we want. And, you know, I think, I think they want Solomon. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it, once again, Dr. Michael Heiser says this, how come we have to have a temple set for sacrifices? Why don't we just hand them a Bible? 
Yeah. I mean, w- why on earth do we need a sacrificial system to be happening? Because the ultimate sacrifice has already been made. Right. Because it's to tell us that it's finished. Yeah. It, it's, it's almost a, a, a spit in the face mm-hmm. of your Savior. Absolutely. Say, uh, sorry, you weren't enough. We still need these examples. It doesn't make sense. Well, and isn't, I mean, again, the, the great commandment, love, isn't love ultimately sacrificing my interests, my, you know, in thinking about other, other people? And it's, it's mm-hmm. you know, I mean, so much of this seems to be pointing to the end game is violent. Yeah. But Jesus doesn't, you know, love, you know, forgive, you know, and I, I just... Are we here in that? No, we're not. <laughs> <laughs> we're not here in the West, and that's that's yeah. you know that's a lot of that's the trouble. Yeah, mm. it, I'm not sure if we want to hear that. I mean, yeah. I feel like when we read through the scriptures, it's it's pretty evident, especially in regards to Christ's teachings. But yeah, I don't know. It, it's not popular. Well, on my soapbox, I think like w- there has been a movement with the younger generation to kind of try to do that but i've seen it also well now you're condemning anybody with a different view you know let's say all right i i don't embrace these things because i think these things are wrong it doesn't mean i'm not embracing the people but that uh then i then i can be vilified and mass attacked from a whole generation of people that so i do think it's more complicated than we it, it sounds easy to just embrace love, but then I think in practice, we humanity hasn't been able to do it ever. Yeah. So Mike is an undercover millennial. Moving on. <laughs> well, yeah, I have four kids, uh, one your... that's turning 18 soon. <laughs> we have a spy in the No, it's, I mean, I, I agree to, you, to that uh, argument is that it's not just theological, it's not just spiritual. Now we have another component, it's political. Right. I mean, there's things happening right now as we speak, you know, with the Temple Mount, uh, Muslims can't go without going through metal detectors, and it was just a huge, huge offense to them. Yeah, as well as to Christians, and um, so we see these things playing out. You know, and, and you have to somehow say, "Man, is there a reason why these things are playing out? Is it could it be bad theology?" I think these are fair questions. I agree. Yeah, I totally agree. There's a plethora of scriptures. I, I've, I've got a bunch of them on the screen. I won't, I won't read all of them. But like, you know, 1 Corinthians three sixteen and 17 says, Do you know that you are the temple of God, and the Spirit of God dwells in you? If any man destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him, for the temple of God is holy, and that is what you are. 1 Corinthians six fifteen, uh, fifteen 15 through 20. Do you know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take away the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? May it never be. Or you not know that the one who joins himself to a prostitute is one body with her? For he says, the two shall become one flesh, but the but he who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. I mean, it goes on and on and talks about how the body of Christ is the new temple. We are the sacred space of Christ and the Holy Spirit. I mean, and like I said, I won't read them all. There's a whole bunch of them. <laughs> but these were written before the temple was destroyed. Am I correct? Yes. Yes, you are correct. So in context then, they wouldn't apply. I wouldn't apply it because the temple hasn't been. I would say there's two types of temples, but I wouldn't say one would replace the other. In context now, in our generation, it's easier to see. But uh, well, It is easier to see. It is. It, it definitely is. But remember, Paul... Because these are these are predominantly Pauline writings, um, outside of Peter, right there. Um, Paul is speaking of a new covenant, and under the new covenant, the temple comes away from being the physical place that is built of stone, and becomes the spiritual place that resides within us. We become the sacred space as we gather, as opposed to the sacred space being inside of the building called the Holy of Holies. So we are now uh, imbued with the Holy Spirit. So we are now the temple of, of Christ. And, you know, even looking at Jesus, you know, the last judgment story, this maybe the only one I could, could get, Matthew 25, you know. Uh, oh, good one. But, yeah. you know, I mean, it, 
where, where is Jesus? You know, I was hungry, you gave me to eat, I was thirsty, I was a stranger, I was naked, I was a prisoner. You know, it's always, you know, what if we treated anyone we identified as another with reverence? Mm. You know, and what would that do to this world? Yeah. Right. And no, to I piggyback agree. on that, what if we treated ourselves as a Fair. holy temple? Well said, yeah. You know, like I could see the blasphemy of waiting for the temple, as you guys pointed out, as, I mean, pornography, any sort of addiction, that sort of thing. That's it. No would more a, red meat. Would, <laughs> would a temple accommodate those? So if we are looking for inspiration, uh, honoring and, and having that reverence as ourselves as a temple, you know, inviting all and being, you know, sort of that conduit, I think that's a motivational Yeah. Inspiration. And we do prostitute ourselves by those things that we that we get straight away from doing. It's part of our sins, though, and to realize that. But even as he's saying there, too, as you think that when he died, when our Lord and Savior died, the curtain in the temple ripped in two. Yeah. It's, it's, the sacredness was gone. Well, there is definitely, yeah. if you if you hearken back to what the, the apostles said, they used the example of the two sons as the old covenant and the new covenant. Remember? Going back to, to Ishmael and Isaac and, and talking about the two sons and how one represents, you know, the old covenant and one represents the new covenant. So it, it's fascinating. They, they, they do make that comparison. You know, and how we are no longer under the old covenant, the old commandments, and now there is a, a higher, a higher calling to those commandments. You know, Jesus tried to talk about it in the Sermon on the Mount, and so many people get so legalistic about it, and they and they point out all the different rules you have to follow. They forget that the the reason for those rules is to make us better people, mm. and yes. to actually help us help each other. And they don't apply to those that don't know Christ. It's true. But the struggle existed way back then, too, though. Yes. Because if you look even at the 12 disciples that walked with Christ, even at the very end in the garden, Peter still wanted to resort to violence. Yeah. You know, and even before then, they were asking, is, you know, is this the time where you're going to restore the kingdom back to, uh, you know, th- during Solomon's time? Right. And Actually, to Eden. They couldn't get outside that mindset of it being an earthly rule. Well, think about it, though. What was Jesus' re- Jesus's response to that? Because Peter reached out and cut his ear off, and what did he do? He healed him. He admonished him, yeah. He healed him, and he rebuked him for using mm-hmm. violence. Yeah. Yep. My kingdom is not of this world, right? Yeah. So, and yet we are supposed to be the ones ushering forth the kingdom, going forth across the world to bring the kingdom into this world. That's what our mission is. Our mission isn't just simply to... And that's where, that's where you know, newer theology and older theology departs because newer theology is we need to reach out so when these people die, they can go to heaven. Older theology is we need to usher forth the kingdom by making sure that all living things know of our Creator, so that way the kingdom will be fully realized here on earth. Yeah, it's true. It, it just perplexes me to see that struggle that existed with Peter, because this is a man that walked with him physically, literally, saw the miracles, partially walked on water. <laughs> all right. <laughs> and yet, yeah, three steps even in. through all of this, still somehow expected something a little bit different at the end. Yeah. You know, and I can relate to that. Yeah. But even as the struggles even after Christ had ascended and in the establishment of the church, you know, the struggles that he had had, you know, with the, between the, uh, the Greeks and the Jews, you know, bringing the, ushering the Greeks into the kingdom, you know, and, and yet he has still had his, his Judy, Judistic, you know, bent that he, you know, these are the traditions, these are the things that, and and yet, yet we're bringing in these Greeks because they they eat funky food, you know. <laughs> <laughs> they have funyuns. <laughs> yeah, and and, and, I, and I I I know this is something I I really struggle with even t- in today's 
culture, you know, that uh, like I'm in what's called art world. And there are not a lot of Christians in that world. Right, and uh, and I'm one of the few, and 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 the people that I'm surrounded with are are very culturally different, and and yeah. have a very tainted and very negative view of, uh, especially evangelicals who, in their their most sincere way, and and trying things, but you know, beat them over the head with their ten pound Schofield Bibles, and, right, and uh, and and just turn or burn, and you know the whole nine yards, and if you ain't this and all that, and to realize that that before we made a conscious decision in our own lives to 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 follow Christ, to be to be a follower of Christ, and and, and commit to that, we didn't instantly all of a sudden all this knowledge hit our head about God and who He was and everything. It didn't instantly come to us, and our sins just didn't immediately go away. They were just forgiven. Right. And 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 some of us still struggle with those sins that we've always struggled with all our lives. With, and yet they keep coming back to haunt us, and they didn't go just go away. In some p- cases they do, but a lot of cases they don't. And and to realize that, that that struggle that we talk about and the love that you talk about, to realize that we show people, to realize that, like, hey, I'm no different than you. Yeah. I'm a human being. I have flesh and blood. I have crazy thoughts in my head, you know, and I'm not this perfect, you know, holy angel you know, that's sitting up in the sky saying, oh, you know, it's, you know, doing tunes and things like this. But you know what? You know, and to realize I'm a sinner just like everybody else. Yeah. I still sin. I'm not gone. Well, I'm not even gone so much, but I'm not I'm not in the in in God's fulfilled kingdom. Yeah. When things yeah. will be perfect. I'm not in Eden. Yeah. To to hearken back on what uh on what on, on what Gumby was saying. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. <laughs> yeah. To harken back on what Gumby was saying, I think in Western Christianity, it makes the same mistake as the Jews of Jesus' day. Absolutely. Because if you look at them, why did they reject Jesus? Because he didn't enter in on a war horse. He entered in on a little white donkey. He came in as somebody who was peaceful, trying to usher in a much deeper spiritual kingdom to help reclaim the earth. And they wanted a war horse, somebody who was going to come in and defeat the Roman armies. Well, we have the same thing in the modern age because the modern evangelical is waiting for this giant Jesus Christ coming back with his armies to vanquish everything and judge everything. And instead of us, yeah, we're going to go horse riding with swords and right, cutting heads off. You right. Know? It, it, instead of us helping to usher in this spiritual kingdom to reclaim the earth on a much deeper level. So I think we are doing the same thing in the modern age. Yeah. But what does it say that? The people who walk closely with Jesus still didn't get it. Like, I mean, first, it relieves me a little bit. Like, <laughs> I don't totally understand this, but I, I didn't even walk with them. And, and he, I know he says that, but could it be that he concentrated on a different message and everybody else was looking for something specific that he didn't care to focus on or that it's always supposed to be a little difficult, you know, because double entendre sort of thing. You can say something and, and have multiple meetings, and I just I feel like that's a powerful aspect of theology and Christianity. So either that was a strategy or he was just preaching this, you know, go out and serve. And we weren't looking for that. We're looking at come here and lead. Right. Great point. Go and Great conquer. point, Mike. Great point. But you're right. Serve. Yeah, sir. Did Jesus Christ say the greatest of among these are those who? I, uh, yeah, I think yeah. It, what it says, Mike, is you know even someone as zealous as Peter was uh, can still be reached if we're pursued with love. Christ never gave up on him, you know, and that's that. That takes work. It's a relationship. I mean, we don't have time for that, do we? Do we have time to reach people? Ain't nobody got time for that. have time for my family. I'm, I'm ready to go right now. Right. <laughs> and Jesus, Jesus did the ultimate thing. He knew that he, I mean, he had risen already. He knew immediately, though, because he knew Peter. Right, yeah. He knew that he, you know, he, he, he screwed up. And yet the remorse, I mean, I know Peter had remorse. He very much so had remorse. But... But I don't think he he was ever he never really probably felt forgiven, hmm. 
and and I think what and what Jesus did was to restore him, to really. And he ha- told him three times, Peter, do you love me? Right. You know, Lord, I love you. Go feed my sheep. Well, and when Jesus came back, I think it says something when when Jesus approached him and said, "Tell the apostles and Peter right. that <laughs> I had risen." He didn't include him as one of the apostles because he hadn't reclaimed him yet. And yet when he brought him back in, that's when he came, you know, that's when he's like, hey, you're still one of mine, you know, it brought him back into that sheepfold, right? Yeah. I always like the you brought up the parable of the two sons earlier, but I always like that the thought that strikes me about that story is, you know, what that son did was a big deal. Yeah. But he is not the sinful jerk. He's the lost son. You know, when you think of like a kid who's lost, it's a sympathetic lens, you know, and like Mm -hmm. even, you know, I mean, can we have that for others? And I think, as you said before, Mike, for ourselves, you know, I mean, I think you were getting at that too, Steve, you know, I mean, that's. And the second brother who just felt like, like I've been with you all along. I've done everything you told me to do. I I did the rules. I didn't disobey. I didn't do any of these things. And here you kill a fatted calf for this dude. Really? (laughs) It's okay, Sandy. But it's not good for you anyway. (laughs) I get excited. He can't. His brother came home, and he's he can't be happy. Right. You know, he's lost too. Yeah. Yeah. And we are, you know, we all are sometimes. We, you know, we all are. It's just red meat, Steve. Don't worry, man. No, I, it's, it's, <laughs> There's a theme here tonight, Steve. <laughs> yes, I know. You it's really not, love your not, steaks, don't you? Red meat. Okay, <laughs> I get it. So I just, I'm sorry. I just, um, I really don't eat steak like it, like it sounds like it. Really uh-huh. Just uh-huh. always want to. Uh-huh. <laughs> well, you know, it, 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 it's nice every now and then, but I would not make a... Definitely not make a, re- a, a habit of it. <laughs> Me think it's that protest far it. too much. Yeah. <laughs> I just hope when you eat that red meat, you enjoy it and you, you know, you appreciate. It's going to be a while. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you don't feel good after eating it. Trust me, I, I didn't know that, but that, but uh, nonetheless, it, I, I think what's just so important that, that we realize that that our sacrifice has been made. And we are the temple. Yep. And so that we, we as brothers and sisters who who claim the name of Christ that as 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 our as our as our Lord, I mean, it, as as who who we will be devoted to. That yes, we do struggle. Yes, we do screw up, and yes, we get it all wrong. And yes, we sometimes hate hate other people and. And, and do all the wrong things and, and the wrong thinking. But through that, though, that as we struggle through that, as we, as we sweat through that, to realize that, that in the end, though, we are, we are his. Yep. And we are forgiven. Yes, we are. And, and that's the part that, that's where that love comes in because... The same compassion that Christ gave to us should be the same compassion that we give those who don't understand that. And and they are stuck in this, and, and I think it causes those who don't understand that to, to believe that there's this, there's this pattern that, oh, you have to do this, this, and this, and this, and therefore you, you can be like me. No. It's just the same way is that you just go broken and open as a broken vessel before him and, and just in humbleness. So he said that even in the, uh, the parable he said about the two men, look at me, Lord, I give to the church. I serve on the elders committee. I do this and I do that and blah, blah, this. And yet there's this humble man who's beating his chest and saying, just forgive me, please. All right. Well, we'll leave that on a high note then. <laughs> so, I want to thank uh, I want to thank David J. LaGuardia for Dave. coming out. <laughs> Please. Thank you for having me. This this was really awesome. Well, you're welcome back. Uh, All right. It was a pleasure having you with us here, and it was a pleasure for me, you know, spending time with you guys. I knew a lot of conversations at the softball field. I thought this is great talking with these guys. Yeah. And yeah lived up to it so thanks we knew it could go deeper too 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was a pleasure having you here. Please check out his book. It sounds incredible. I can't wait to get my copy. Yeah, we'll have it tonight. <laughs> I am not God. I am not God, yeah. I think it's searching for a path toward personal and global well-being. We'll post a link for you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Mike, for hosting us tonight. I am uh, I'm remodeling our studio right now, so I have to thank Mike for hosting us. From the heart of downtown Cleveland, Terminal Towers. It's a pretty cool place, but you're very welcome. <laughs> really awesome place. Definitely. And thank you for the beers, Mike. Yeah. It was my turn. Home yeah, run, Mike. Sure. Great. How are you, right? Great Great beers. Park. Good place. <laughs> And as Gumby would say, there's there's nothing taboo over brew, as you can tell. There's not. No, there's not. <laughs> if you like what you hear, also, please check us out on Tumblr, Google+, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And you can always drop down to BibleOfBrews.com, managed by Mike. <laughs> Have a great night. Peace out. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.